Hello and welcome to the webinar for the Urban Agenda Grant Program. This webinar will give you some guidance about the program, how it fits into the one-stop continuum, and some important deadlines for the application process. Uh, this is a roadmap of what we can expect today. We're going to talk about the community one-stop for growth, urban agenda in specific, how urban agenda fits into the one-stop, some important program parameters, including how to be competitive, some examples of successful past applications, some guidance for completing the full application, and key dates and opportunities to get guidance as you navigate the application process. Um, please note this is a recording, so you can feel free to pause at any time um, if you want to review the slides in a little bit more depth. Um, I will certainly um, give you an overview, but I also don't want to read everything to you off the screen that you can read too. So the community one stop for growth is a main driver of economic development in the continuum. Um in excuse me, main driver of economic development in the Commonwealth. Um, and the one stop for growth is a collaboration between the Executive Office of Economic Development, the Executive Office of Housing and Livable Communities, and Mass Development. The one stop is an application portal that combines 12 of the Commonwealth's top housing and economic development grant programs into a single application and review process. You can see here um, the three uh, agencies who are primarily working on this one stop. Um, you streamline the one stop streamlines the applicant experience while allowing the three state agencies to engage in a coordinated review. And the agencies work together to make sure the funding provided has the greatest possible impact across the Commonwealth. For a deeper dive into the one-stop process, we recommend viewing the one-stop webinar one overview webinar, which is currently available on the one-stop website. That's mass.gov slash one-stop. So when we're thinking about urban agenda in specific as a program and where it fits into the one-stop, um, we think of it as part of the sort of preparing for growth end of a development uh, continuum here, and specifically as part of community activation and placemaking. So you'll see here with our nice little red outline box, the equitable workforce and business development programming, that is the work of Urban Agenda here. So we have three categories of application, uh, which you can choose from, which are entrepreneurship and small business development, workforce development and training initiatives, and community organizing and leadership development. So this development framework, uh, the development continuum, the framework represents a life cycle of major community development projects from the initial community visit visioning to the final construction. Each development continuum category is made up of multiple project types, which are shown in bold on the screen. And we talked a little bit of Urban Agenda just being the Equitable Workforce and Business Development Programming category. All right, Urban Agenda specifically. Um, program staff, I am Alexandra Puglio, Deputy Director for Communities and Programs, um, and I lead Urban Agenda. We will also have a wonderful new program manager to be hired who is specifically working with the grantees um, during the grant cycle. The purpose of this program in general, it's a competitive grant program that funds community-driven responses to community-defined economic opportunities. So we're really looking to fund um, projects and programs that reflect the needs of specific communities through the organizations that work in those communities. And as a result, the eligible applicants are nonprofit organizations and governments. So it could be a municipality, could be a other like government sector, like a, um, so we have had some like sheriff's offices, um, other organizations that are units of state government as well. Um, so in terms of project parameters here, um, the project budget, you have a maximum award of $100,000. Um, you can request from anywhere from $0 to $100,000. Um, the project timeline is about six months. Generally, grant awards are made fully contracted. And projects usually begin at the beginning of the new calendar year. 
and then the project must be completed by June 30th of 2025. So that usually gives folks about six months to complete their project. And projects certainly can operate outside of that timeline, but during that roughly six month window is the only period for which um, grant expenses are reimbursable. So, and the project can operate outside of that timeline, but we're gonna be looking at only at the activity that's happening during that window. In terms of ways that grantees can use their funds, it's a general operating support grant program. So um, that means things like personnel, um, equipment you might need, materials you might need, um, if you need a meeting space, if you need um, food for a meeting, if you need to make flyers, those things are all um, considered general operating expenses. It is important to note um, when you're thinking about the grant funds and how they're distributed. This is a cost reimbursement grant. So that means that um, the Commonwealth is going to need to see documentation of all the expenses that you're incurring um, against those grant funds. 50% um, of the grant is paid upfront at the time of contracting. And then the remaining balance is paid out at the end of the fiscal year. So after June 30th. Um, so Grantees are going to want to be aware that they're going to need to track their spending on this program very carefully um, and provide documentation of that, T-E-O-E-D. Specifically for this program, capital purchases are not eligible use of funds. So you can't purchase real estate, you can't do construction or renovation um, under this grant program. Those aren't considered eligible. Um, unfortunately, we won't be able to fund any of those applications. And the grant program does allow you to charge for some like overhead costs. However, that can't exceed 15% of the total budget for the program um, or the total grant budget. Okay, thinking about how to be competitive. So if you're interested in applying for this grant program, um, there's a few like core criteria to really keep in mind. Um, when we look for, the program, the applications that are best aligned with the program. We're looking for our local coalitions. This could be a formal coalition. It could be a partnership of two organizations. It could be other kind of like associations and affiliations. But we really want to know that the project is being both initiated and led by this community-based group of organizations that is working actively together. So this means more than a referral relationship. This is a ongoing um, co-led project um, where organizations may have different responsibilities, um, but they are working in tandem to achieve the same goal. And the strongest coalitions are multi-sector. They might involve both the private sector, for-profit businesses, the public sector, like municipal governments, um, citizen groups, um, other individual residents of the community. Um, or other like kind of informal organizations in the community as well. We're looking for projects that are community-based. So really looking at one specific city, town, or well-defined neighborhood. So um, the project will take place in this, in this one geographic location and will serve folks primarily from that one geographic location. Um, this is reflecting, again, the kind of local coalition um, that is carrying out the priorities of a local group. So really keeping it local, keeping it to one single well-defined community. We're looking for a roughly six-month timeline. We talked about this a little bit already. That The project will take place over a six-month period from January to June. And we're looking for an economic need or opportunity. That there is a specific need or an opportunity in that community that is a priority of the place that it's the project is taking place in. So whether that's an opportunity to bring a special group of folks together um, or there's a particular need in terms of workforce development or small business assistance that is in some way kind of special to that community. 
those are four things that we most particularly look for when we're evaluating these applications. And this is kind of our general project um, evaluation criteria. Um, this is scored on a 100 point scale. Um, I won't read each of these to you. Um, you certainly are welcome to pause and read them. And they are also in the RFP, um, or excuse me, in the guidelines. All right, but in general, we're looking for a very specific and clear target population. So that could mean um, as much as you can define the folks that your project is seeking to serve. It could be, you know, specifically looking to work with um, out of school teenagers who are um, at risk of justice involvement, or they could mean you're specifically looking to serve um, immigrant business owners in a particular community. So you really want to have that to be as clear and as um, evident as possible because that will kind of steer a lot about of the evaluation about whether um, the project is serving the, the target community that you set forward. We're looking for outcomes and impacts. Um, I really want to be as specific as possible here. You really want to make sure that the outcomes are both specific and measurable, right? So um, if you're talking about the you know, number of people served, the number of folks completing, say, a training program, um, the number of businesses who would be offered um, technical assistance, um, being as specific and measurable as you can um, will make the project stronger. And project need, right? So we talked from the beginning about this being a uh, project that looks for ways to directly serve the needs of a particular community. And this is where you're going to show that this project is something the community needs and wants. The community has been working together um, towards this goal and um, that it will you know, address this particular economic need or opportunity. Collaborations and partnership. This is where you're going to show this group of organizations that have been working together, who they are, how they're working together. Um, what about this collaboration is unique or innovative? Um, that's that's a great way to um, really demonstrate something special about the project. And lastly, capacity is to succeed. So we're really looking for a scope of work that makes sense, right? So it's tied into the target population and tied into the outcomes that you expressed elsewhere. This is like a strategic and equity oriented planning process that you've already put some thought into how this would be carried out in this pretty short six month timeline. Um, and that you have a really detailed budget. And so we're going to ask you to um, be able to provide some of that detail about um, how the funds would be spent. So making sure that that um, sort of reflects the overall goals of the project as well. Okay, so we're gonna talk about a few successful um, previous applicants here. Um, our first example is Lawrence Community Works. Um, their project is called the Community Educator Pipeline and it's a workforce development program that both creates career pathways for low-income Lawrence parents and other community members and diversifies the educator workforce in the city's public schools. So um, there is a group behind this project, um, the Lawrence Working Families Initiative, which is a cross-sector collaboration and two-generation approach to student success um, that involves family economic progress, supporting parents with education, training, and job placement and advancement. So when we think about what makes this a successful project, it really has a robust and ongoing partnership with multiple type of types of partners, right? So you have nonprofits, you have public schools, you have higher education, and you have individual community members, folks from the community who are um, shaping the process and folks who are going through the training. It really responds to specific community identified needs actually more than one of them. Um, both the need for um, training in order to help folks get into the workforce um, and especially helping parents get jobs that sort of reflect their um, children's school schedules, 
but it also um, responds to a community need to have more educators in a particular city that reflect the demographics of that city. And this project is focused on clearly defined community, right? The city of Florence and geographic area. And it has equity considerations built in, right? Part of the goals of this project are around um, having a diverse educator workforce. Um, and that is one of the goals from the beginning. And so the program um, overall reflects those goals throughout. Another successful example is the town of Middleborough. So Middleborough's exploratory year program funds hands-on education, training, and workforce development for high school graduates. The program aims to support local businesses by connecting successful YouthWorks interns to community businesses for mentorship and many apprenticeships. This again has a great focus on a single geographic community. It's all taking place in the town of Middleborough. It involves community specific needs, right? So both um, small businesses in the community have a need to attract the next generation of workers who will stay in the town um, and both work and spend their money there. And it also helps young people to find good jobs that they're interested in in the same community. So in this case, lots of community benefits here and demonstrating this public-private partnership. So the Chamber of Commerce, the public schools, student groups, and mass hire all working together to help um, both the students and the small businesses or community businesses um, get what they need from this particular uh, project. And the last example, um, New North Citizens Council in Springfield. Um, this project uses individualized placement supports for workforce development to support Springfield's Latino community. Through this model, participants receive help to find and keep a regular paid job in the competitive labor market, while also supporting local businesses that hire program participants. So this has some common elements with the project we just talked about in terms of responding to sort of those dual needs, right? The needs of both the small businesses and the residents in the community. Um, this project, again, has a clear target population, right? You're looking specifically at Springfield's Latino community, specific geographic focus, city of Springfield. Equity is central to the project, right? So they're looking at a demographic group who is traditionally um, not been as well served by workforce development programs and by um, the economy in general. So they're looking specifically to bring more equity into the workforce. They're responding to a community identified need. Um, work, they've worked with community groups and they know that folks are looking for um, better employment opportunities. And this project has a robust partnership. It includes government, nonprofits, and the private sector. So those are the examples of some strong projects. Um, certainly this program um, really encourages as much like kind of creative, innovative thinking as possible. You don't have to fit one of these molds to be a successful um, applicant, but these are some examples of how folks are really meeting those core criteria that we talked about at the beginning in a way that also reflects the needs of their community. So you've watched this webinar thus far, you're thinking about completing a full application. Um, this is, gives you some sense of how you would um, apply in the actual full application. Um, you're gonna look at the development continuum. You're gonna select community activation and placemaking as you can see here on the right. Um, and then the project type would be equitable workforce and business development programming. And then you would select which of the three project focuses best matches the project that you're interested in. So um, you would then choose whether you wanted to apply under the entrepreneurship, small business development and technical assistance category. 
the workforce development, training initiatives, and job pipelines category, or the community organizing and leadership development category. And you can find more information about completing the full application at mass.gov slash one stop. And you can view one stop webinar two application guidance. All right, some opportunities for guidance. So as you're navigating this application process, um, there are several opportunities to learn more about the programs and to potentially see um, if the project you have in mind fits well into the category that you are interested in applying for. So the first opportunity is the expression of interest, um, which is a great opportunity to receive guidance on your project ideas prior to starting a full application. So the expression of interest will be open through April 30th and is available directly on the One Stop website. So again, that's mass.gov slash one stop. Um, and that's kind of a very brief summary of what you have in mind. Um, and you will receive feedback on it. Then there's the one stop program webinars. That's what you're here doing right now, but there's also a wide variety of other webinars. You can also visit the one stop program to access all the FY25 webinars, including the three one-stop webinars released annually, as well as the program-specific ones. And last but not least, um, new this year, we have office hours. So there will be three general guidance office hours that will answer questions about the one-stop process in particular, um, and technology as well. So if you have a question about um, how the application works, um, you're having trouble, that's a great opportunity to hear more. Um, staff from each program will also host their own office hour to answer any applicant questions related to the program. Um, in this case for Urban Agenda, the office hours will be held on February 28th at 11 a.m. Registration is on the One Stop website for those office hours and please submit your questions in advance and specify that the question is for the Urban Agenda office hours. That will help us answer your questions as effectively as possible. All right, and the round timeline here. Um, so the full application and expressive expressions of interest open in January slash February. Um, that means that the applicants may now begin to work on applications in the IGX system, but they will, applications will only be accepted during the actual submission period. Then the one-stop guidance phase from January to May. Um, this is these, these webinars that will be hosted by the one-stop team, um, as well as the individual programs. The full application submission period, which begins in May and June, it begins in May, ends in June. Um, you may submit your full application beginning May 6th. Applications must be submitted by the full application deadline of 11.59 p.m. on Wednesday, June 5th. Then uh, the applications will be re reviewed and evaluated. Um, the OneStop team will also conduct joint application reviews across the agencies. Um, then, uh, notification of grant decisions uh, will be in September of 2024. So once final recommendations have been approved, applicants will be notified in writing and announcement events will be scheduled. So that brings us to the end of our presentation here. Thank you so much if you've watched all the way through, appreciate that. Um, please feel free to check out mass.gov slash one stop for a lot more information, um, as well as individual guidance about, uh, as we proceed through this application phase. So thank you very much and best of luck with your applications.